Uh, to start the session, I now call upon Dr. Hemanti Chaudhary to please unmute yourself and start the screen sharing. Okay, okay, I'll start. Over to you, doctor. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, doctor. And I'm audible as well, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So should I start the presentation? Yes, doctor. Okay. A hearty good morning to one and all present here. At the very outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Satangshu Mathur for giving me this opportunity to be a part of the second session. I will be talking on a very important topic, which is the cataract surgery protocol in COVID era. So first and foremost, we will talk about the American Academy of Ophthalmology guidelines on what are the role and interpretation of testing prior to surgery. So if the patient has no clinical suspicion of COVID, no exposure or no symptoms, we have to use standard surgical PPE. For a person who is RT-PCR positive, he are recommended to delay the surgery by six weeks. If he is RT-PCR negative, you can proceed with the surgery with standard PPE. Serology positive, we have to again go ahead and advise RT-PCR. Antigen negative, it is still not reliable and we have to get an RT-PCR done. Post-vaccination, since we'll get too many patients now post-vaccination, they will still require an RT-PCR testing prior to surgery. What is the practice that we follow? We prefer to get an RT-PCR done, preferably within 72 hours window. If it is negative, we'll take up for surgery. And if it is positive, we'll defer the surgery. So post-COVID, what is the suggested wait time as recommended by the American Society of Anesthesiologists? The wait time should be four weeks if the patient was asymptomatic and recovered from mild non-respiratory symptom. Wait time of six weeks if patient had respiratory symptoms not requiring hospitalization. Wait time is increased to eight to 10 weeks if the patient was symptomatic and had comorbidities like diabetes or immunocompromised. The wait time is 12 weeks if the patient was admitted to ICU due to COVID-19. So what is the protocol that we follow. One day prior to surgery, the patient is contacted to inquire about any symptoms of COVID. The entry is done after thermal screening, hand sanitizer. Only one attendant per patient is allowed. The street cloth has to be changed before entering the OR and both patient and attendant will wear mask at all times. This is very important and we do follow that. We have to ensure safe distancing and space out surgery appointments to avoid overcrowding. So on the day of surgery, what is the getup of the surgeon? The surgeon has to wear a double mask, a three-ply mask, and over that an N95. Protective goggles is recommended, gloves, of course. And the PPE is not the one that the medicine people wear while entering the COVID ward. Our standard surgical scrubs are good. And patients should wear masks all through. So this is the five-person COVID on iodine that we put topically inside the patient's eye and the scrubbing around the periorbita is done with 10% povidone iodine. Our hand washing is done with 7.5% povidone iodine followed by alcohol rub and the water has to be treated at the user end and do use AquaGuard water to wash the hands. This is what the surgeon uses. First a three-ply mask over that an N95 and do note that the upper end of the N95 is marked with uh, leveled with a cello tape or a med pore. This is the eye protective goggles that we use. During the surgery, we have to ensure proper draping, spread viscoelastic over the cornea so that no risk of much aerosolization. At the end of surgery, discard disposables and we avoid observers sitting at the observer scope. So this is how we also do the patient. Each patient is given a brand new three-ply mask before they enter the OT. Upper end of the mask is again taped with a met pore tape and it is cut flush to the skin so that there is no gap here. And we do the painting with 10% povidone iodine. And what we also do one extra thing is 
we put betadine in this pouch here so that the fluid that comes here is mixed with betadine once it is uh, aerosolized. This is also another type of mask, which is also quite safe. It is the 3M respirator. But for me, I don't find it too comfortable. So I use it in the OPD and in the OR, as I have already mentioned. This is this before, after each case, the OT table has to be cleaned with bacillosid yeah. and you have to space out the surgery. Yeah. Good morning, and these are certain specific Mr. precautions which need to be taken. These are suggested by the AO. FACO as such has not been proven to be an infective aerosol generating procedure. Why? Because each time the aqueous of the patient is replaced either by trypan blue first, then by BSS and finally by viscoelastic. So whichever thing that is being aerosolized is the sterile visco or BSS and not the patient's aqueous. So we can say that the risk of aerosolized virus is quite low. Some modification for post-operative care can be done by reducing the number of post-op visits, and you can take the help of teleophthalmology for that. Thank you very much for your kind hearing. Thank you, Dr. Emati. You have covered almost everything. Uh, it Thank is you, not very important and not anything third way we are expecting. So we have to be more careful. We have to keep adding more things on it. But sir, you, and you want to add anything else over it? Dr. O.P. Agarwal. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think we should move to next session. Yes, uh, doctor. Next. Dr. O.P. Agarwal here? Yeah, I am here only. You can. We are waiting for next because you can. Sir, 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 I'm sir, I'm also there. Sir, I'm also yeah. there. Yes. Manisha, you are here? Yes, sir. Very much here. Okay. That Thank is you, perfect. Dr. Hemanthi, for the wonderful session. We I now call out after the topics. Okay. Yes, doctor. I now call out our next speaker, Dr. Manisha Rati, to please start the screen sharing and start the session. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes, doctor. Very well, very well. Start the slideshow. <laughs> Yesterday there was a... so everything has been covered beautifully. I saw the other topics, OT protocol and cataract surgery, everything. So I'm taking into account general consideration and how our viewpoint has evolved. Last year they said take hydroxychloroquine. Then they said no, take isomectin. And Excuse now me, ma'am, slideshow. Yeah, I'll just start the slideshow. Here. So these are the uh, my topic is prerequisites for ocular surgery in the COVID era. As of now in our institute, we have 200 cases of mucomycosis. So routine elective surgeries are not being done, only excentrations. There is so much pressure on ophthalmologists to start elective surgery even after the lockdown. This, uh, as all you know, that there are, with the Delta strain, there is much more fear and much more contamination and much more rate of infection and infectivity. So what do we do now? Why does it matter? Because ophthalmologists are among the most susceptible population. We have too much information, yet no foolproof method, high morbidity and mortality of COVID-19 and backlog of surgery are what we are juggling in the air to decide what to do for each patient, how to protect healthcare workers and patients. So this, the French Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine has introduced guidelines based on a standardized questionnaire and algorithm about COVID-19 to assess patients preoperatively, which I'm sure everyone is doing and a joint task of the Chinese Society of Anesthesiology. Again, as very beautifully explained, patients enter one at a time, they wear the PPE, body temperature should be less than 37.3, gloves uh, should be changed in the pre-op area after each patient and sanitization, after each patient, even in the OPD, this is recommended. Suspected patients are reported to the infection center immediately and referred. So in the questionnaire, there are five major symptoms fever, dry cough, difficulty, mm -hmm. loss of smell and taste. And there are 10 minor symptoms also which are taken into account. This has proved to be quite reliable for a general screening. These are the minor symptoms. And this is the protocol that is being followed. More than one major symptom and more than two minor symptoms are definitely you go in for further investigation. If the test is positive, then you consider the HRCT on the eighth day and the second PCR test and all. If there's low suspicion, but with contact, Again, you can decide whether to test or not. In our country, we have to consider there are paucity of testing kits, there's paucity of PPE. So please be very careful to save yourself and the patient 
and not to give in to pressure at the same time not deprive someone of the surgery that they so require this is the, what has been followed by the task force mm -hmm. and it has proved to be quite effective what are the challenges for us it's money 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 we are a government medical college which a huge influx of patients and a huge backlog of cataract cases and patients willing for surgery in between we were doing so many surgeries when the lockdown was lifted but lack of resources so we ma maximize whatever we have and make sure that we do not contaminate anyone who comes to us and so the standard sop has been dealt beautifully ideally day care procedure except in cases of rop and congenital glaucomas mandatory covid consent and in emergencies at any time they must be done lens induced glaucoma single eyed legally blind uh, patients mature hypermature cataracts pediatric cataracts congenital glaucoma when should you not operate you uh, preferably avoid ga because of aerosolization nasal procedures avoid cam surgeries definitely and decrease these are the guidelines given in 2020 which are still evolving so that time they had said hcq prophylaxis but there are wonderful guidelines in there there should be an mpor covid dedicated or there should be multi speciality which is uh, adept at dealing with covid 19 again two weeks six weeks how much you defer is all the same what i really liked all this retrofitting uh, retrofitting of dynamic uv and ultra filters to hepa reduction of turbulence in the or apparently this really helps if it's possible minimize opening and closing of doors moving of the machines use the same machines for the same the same physician consultation must be taken to rule of, uh, out any airway pathology particularly pneumonia in such patients and uh, screening should be done so choose the quickest possible surgical procedure avoid ga unless it's mandatory you prefer tropical anesthesia pp whatever you can provide and positive ventilation no two patients together 20 minute gap sanitization between each patient you know the 4 minute thing so prefer topical anesthesia and again aerosolization during phaco there are some studies says not that much but there are concerns so why not msics another of my favorite topics so you can consider that there are points to ponder the conclusion that's overwhelming and it's still not over there are limited resources you have to channel them wisely so these are the specific surgery thing keep your guard up it's not over till it's over we are fighters and kudos to all the ophthalmologists and indians thank you so much for giving me this opportunity 4 minutes up <laughs> thank you sir excellent manisha <clears throat> nice presentation dr bharti has yet to join because he is ot he will be joining 5 minutes time dr op your comments yeah nice presentation everything is well covered thank you uh practically we uh, talk practically all these guidelines i don't think any of the hospital can follow yes sir okay uh in practical for practical purposes my suggestion is whatever nabs suggest if we will follow all those rules and regulations and uh, protocols absolutely we will be 95% safer in any types of epidemic or nab pandemic or anything so my suggestion for ever is to follow the guidelines uh, uh, made to all available all of us by nabh yes sir that is the good thing whether we get nabh or we don't get nabh if you we'll start following those guidelines we will be much safer even with all other patients of uh, us having hiv having australia antigen positive uh, having all other uh, contaminating diseases yes. that, that is the best way to work so we are an apex institution we are tertiary care center regional institute of ophthalmology yes. with four units specialty and all so we have been handling the onslaught since last year lockdown was announced very late and then they said okay you must operate on cases because nobody wants you to stop the surgery so we have been very careful with our resources whether we are buying our own uh, n95 providing to all the staff patients as a practical problem i have one query from everyone patients find it very cumbersome to wear them especially the elder elderly patients they say we can't breathe let let covid come in it's not there in my village it's not there in my home so this was what main concern we say put your mask up and they'll say do you recognize me you know the moment they sit next to you they breathe on you they cough on you and they say remember you operated on me you know so sir we have to keep trying and we cannot give up the fight yeah dr manisha we agree with you on that as dr op agarwal suggested Yes. We have to make our own guidelines according to our safety, our patient safety. In the patient, like you have told, we are not able to breathe properly. 
I have, I have a one emergency case with the COPD and I tried the oxygen and giving at the time of surgery and that was very useful. And next, if God knows, if we have a third wave, yes. so I have got alternative <laughs> to operate the patient with, with mask, with providing them the oxygen. With the, the that so is Dr. Samantha has also joined us. Dr. Samantha, any comment to you? You have yes. Good government morning. Government? No, 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 no. That's right. Uh, actually, in our government setup, we also follow the same protocol. Uh, but still, now we are doing very less number of surgeries. Very less number with all those precautions taken by uh, what described by Dr. Haimanti Chaudhuri. Those are all very important protocols what we are following in our government setup also. Dr. Bharti has joined us. We would like to hear him first before we have a discussion. Dr. Bharti, sir, you can share this. We all know Dr. Bharti is now the surgeon, my guru from Delhi. And we would love to hear it from him. Yeah, you can do Dr. Bharti. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, for your wonderful session. I now call upon Dr. Sudhak Bharti to please unmute yourself and start the screen sharing. I think you can hear me. I have unmuted myself. Yes. Can you? Yes, yes doctor. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bharti, I have... Roti actually has just joined us years okay. later. You can start the session, doctor. Thank you, Satanshu. Thank you, Ecoin, President, and everyone else, and giving me this opportunity for. Uh, for sharing my experience. So I'll be talking about, can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Sir. yes. So I'll be uh, talking about change in OT practice uh, during COVID. And um, there has been tremendous change in the in the COVID practices, the OT practices during this time. And we have had a very tough time in the last one year, which is uh, actually tough on both uh, the practices and financial aspect. So disruption by COVID-19 uh, in April 2020 was 95% uh, reduction in the OPD and 99% reduction in, uh, in IPD. And we were running only the emergency OPD and OT services. Now, after even after second uh, phase or second bout of uh, uh, the COVID-19, OPD is 50% and IPD is still 30 to 40%, which is still, you know, uh, the tough time is not over. Now, okay, here we, I have to, you know, kind of take it out from here. Okay. So, um, all people who were uh, patients who were coming in the, uh, the hospital, they were scanned and if there's a fever detected, they cannot enter and sent to bigger COVID center, basically. Uh, they should be recognized and confirmed by their mobile numbers, especially uh, with the Arogya Setu app, which was downloaded uh, as they were asked to download before entering the hospital. Um, we did not uh, do any routine uh, OT to about four weeks and it was gradually increased. So at three to four quarters, I remember we thought that it will be back to 50% and it is about a year. Still, we are not 50% uh, totally. And uh, they were very skeptical about health and finance and impact is absolute. And uh, the most things, uh, you know, related to cataract and refractive are really pushed back. And since I'm a cataract and refractive surgeon, the financial impact was really very high. And uh, retina was first to start because it was always an emergency and patient had a uh, kind of uh, difficulty, big difficulty in uh, uh, seeing and doing things. Uh, all known or suspected COVID patients requiring surg surgical intervention must be treated li like positive until proven otherwise. And uh, majority of uh, key management roles were given to the senior staff and not to all of the staff members. And we did not take any GA patients. Uh, change to scrubs in the hospital, that is still the norm. And PPE for staff at risk. And uh, the gown, the cap, mask, gloves, protective glasses, shoe covers, they were given. 
and they were removed by leaving a non disposable potent 0.5% sodium hypochlorite and washed the same day and then next day they were you know changed uh, necessary pp was uh, fftp2 or 3 mask in high risk cases and disposable waterproof gowns double gloves which we still you know practice protective goggles visors shoe covers caps patient is also still going in with the mask though i have seen that couple of patients when they are lying down while doing cataract surgery uh, the the uh, the carbon carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide build up in the mask is very high and sometimes the patient is have some difficulty while waking up after the surgery even when it is 10 minutes of so surgery uh, negative pressure ot which we all have and uh, minimum you know uh, movement of the staff all disposables and uh, uh, like me the beard should have mask with adequate cover so that there is no air exchange in the ot from me to others and others to me only day care surgeries or emergency surgeries in all those cases which were brought in for um, surgeries had chest x rays and uh, we were only working during routine hours in fact uh, less than routine hours from the normal routine hours for our center was 8 to 7 we were working from 10 to 2 initially and now 10 to 4 all surgeries were done with by the senior team for quick and safe surgery and with the minimal staff choose the quickest possible surgical procedure where you are most comfortable and topical anesthesia absolutely no general anesthesia Uh, basically in initial phases because general anesthesia there was a lot of um, uh, and no positive pressure in ot during uh, and up to 20 minutes after so uh, you know uh, and smoke evacuation after diathermy and aerosol generating procedure such as intubation extubation cautery should be done with the full ppe and uh, between the two two surgeries earlier we were keeping a, a 20 minute gap and changed everything but now it is a no more practice 20 minutes we de- we do not and we do a gap of 10 uh, minutes to change everything okay sorry now so, you can continue sir yeah because i think it was 10 minutes it's still 5 yeah, okay. minutes over 5 minutes sir yes yeah yeah so uh, disinfection of ot the protocol and uh, as i said and hcqs we started initially but then they proven uh, the the efficacy and everything necessity was not uh, seen so we stopped it uh, uh, immediately we were not keeping a long list now since the people have taken enough precautions we are trying to keep long lists also but not like uh, t- more than 10 cases and uh, even when even then you know sometimes we have you want to keep lesser than that um, right and the most important thing was the staggered cases like how many cases you can do and how many long and short cases you can do and uh, if we want to do longer hours than two or three teams were Uh, you know uh, uh, used and uh, you know minimum number in the ot but maximum number of ot's where we take minimum number of cases we postponed all the infected ga and camps absolutely no camps in last one year as everybody is uh, uh, clear about it counseling uh, is very important with the patient okay. and the attendant and uh, the special consent given by aios we are using and at least 12 hours before we gave the consent to the patient to read at home and bring next morning uh, for signature uh, basically well established plans to perform undeferable surgical procedures and emergencies on covid-19 positive patient is mandatory and they we prepared a specific internal protocols and arrange adequate training of the involved personnel for for these covid tough times dr so, bakhti sir uh, precisely we would like to have a discussion with yes, you yes sir we would like to have a discussion with you so okay. you realize it we will have a discussion with you sir please please go forward please go no sir we are at a discussion with you please, please you can go ahead. Sir. and you i'll stop sir. sir 
तो एनी क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर मराठे सर फ्रॉम डॉक्टर भारती सर आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन टू सर आई कैन आई कैन हियर यू सर आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन माथुर सर हाउ इज द नेगेटिव प्रेशर क्रिएटेड इन द ओटी डॉक्टर भारती सर डॉक्टर भारती डॉक्टर भारती सर अनम्यूट योरसेल्फ यस आई एम आई एम द क्वेश्चन अबाउट आई एम अनम्यूट क्वेश्चन रोटी आई एम Emma, do you are again ask your question, Doctor? Yes, sir. Sir Bharti, sir, I have a question. How is the sir? How are you creating the negative pressure in the OT? The OT. Doctor, O P. Agar wal, we are not creating negative pressure. We are saying that no negative pressure should be there. So, sir, they have recommended it air. They have said negative pressure. Positive pressure all the time, so that no outside air. you know how that amount the for a lot of uh, changes has to made in the air conditioning that have been mentioned by the many people in our days but all are we all are not able to do it in our centers main thing is that we should not allow the outside air to enter inside our body that opia agarwal what and your nbs says about it sir it is all uh, we are using hepa filter ah yeah. air handling unit and that is uh, changing the air of uh, ot environment uh, every time and we are taking single patients at a time so that the chances of cross infection is uh, minimal and uh, we have to keep uh, interval of at least 15 to 20 minutes for uh, each patient to be taken in the ot dr bharti wants to say something yeah i said that with the normal laminar flow we were changing the the air every 15 to 20 times yeah. you know but now it is uh, the protocol is to change it every uh, minute 25 times so that is the increase in the uh, you know performance of the uh, air change which is very important so that there is a lot of air which is circulating is a... yeah can you hear me yes sir now can you hear me yeah so we can uh, change the air more than 20 times ideally it should be 15 uh, 25 times so that uh, there is a, a more filtered and clean air which is coming on top. ओके सर थैंक यू सर भारती सर भारती सर यस कैन यू लिसन मी सर या या आई कैन आई कैन वेरी वेल सर सर दे इज देयर एनी रोल ऑफ प्री ऑपरेटिव दिस हाइड्रोक्लोरोक्विन एज मेनी पीपल आर टेलिंग नो इनिशियली देयर वाज दिस प्रोटोकॉल ऑफ गिविंग एचसीक्यूएस टू ऑल ऑफ अस Right. and our staff members for uh, uh, once every week mm -hmm. that was the protocol but now uh, when they realize that doesn't serve any purpose they have stopped the use of uh, hcqs as a prophylactic measure right. so we also took it for about 4 weeks all of us okay so dr prakash marathe sir anything you want to explain over it dr prakash marathe so best the better things are that we have already gone through the second covid phase the third phase we are expecting so we have to make our protocols our own protocols which are convenient to us to our patients and which are safe in the court of law so we have to be put documented we should take all precautions we should not go as a routine surgery where we are doing in the normal times dr samanta sir yes In Chhatris Gaur, in government sector, it's a standard rule to keep the patients for three nights, no day care surgery, because here, as per this Arog Gosetu, Jojana, and others, patients must have to be kept for three nights in the indoor. One pre-operative day and two post-operative day. One operative day and one post-operative day. 
in that case we have to take so all precautions about this artificial beforehand chest x ray as well as sorry to interrupt you doctor we will have to conclude the session okay uh, it's a continuous session by association of community of ophthalmology of india that's our session on again yes. our session up to 11:30 so you can invite other person thank you very much all the chair person thank you so much samanta sir thank you thank you sir opportunity dr lakesh madaria dr bharti sir everybody dr marathi sir thank you very much now we go thank you, sir. thank you so much thank you ardhi misha Thank oh, you, Doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Manthi. Now we go for the next equine session. Yeah, you can uh, local host. You can take over now. Okay. I now introduce the chairpersons: Doctor A. Desh Pandey, Doctor Manoj Kar, Doctor Rain Singha, Doctor Srinivas Joshi, Doctor Santosh Patel, and Doctor Lalit Nepali. Moderators: Doctor Nalin. Dr. Manish Shristava, Dr. Raj Kumari Vidya, to please switch on the camera. Our speaker for the session is Dr. Ellie Pradhan. Do we have Dr. Ellie? Hello. We welcome you all in the next session yes, of the coin. We are just finished the first session of coin today. So, Dr. Samantha is here with me. Dr. Nepal. Yes. Dr. Ellie. Welcome you, Bar. Welcome you. She is from Nepal. She is presenting a paper now today. So we can moderator here today. You can invite Dr. Elena. Who is the moderator? You can invite. Thank you very much. You can invite Dr. Eli. Yes. Doctor Eli, you can yeah. please start the presentation. Over yeah. to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon sir, Satan so sir, for inviting me in this, uh, you know, the coin session. So I'm going to start my presentation, and the presentation is um, about uh, diagnostic investigations in ocular trauma. I'm from Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology, Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, so yes, I'm going to start now. I'm the medical retina consultant working there. So this is my financial disclosure. Um, so imaging is necessary uh, to assess the extent of injuries uh, because of the surrounding periorbital soft tissue swelling and other associated injuries. And also like, because at this time of acute trauma, physical examination of globe is difficult and the patient cooperation is also limited by unresponsiveness, altered meditation and sedation. There are various uh, imaging techniques like plain X-ray, ultrasound, both A and B scan, and now UVM, computed, uh, uh, computerized tomography scan, CT, MRI, and optical forensic tomography. Yeah, so I'll go few slides in each. Plain radiograph uh, has uh, about 64 to 78% of sensitivity of uh, orbital fractures, but this value is much lower for soft tissue injuries assessment. It is the first step for metallic foreign body due to its accessibility and low cost. For direct visualization, there are two exposures at right angle, um, AP and lateral view can be taken. As you can see, there is a radio opaque body in left orbit. And, and this is quite old one, probably new, uh, you know, doctors and residents might not know about this limbal ring. For localization, intraocular foreign body X-ray is taken with, this is the metabolic ring, a uh, contact lens with radio uh, opaque marker over cornea. So, and then the distance can be measured. So advantages, uh, documents the presence and number of metallic foreign bodies in the IR orbit, defines orbital wall and skull fracture. It is very cost effective and medical legal and documentary role is important. However, this is less specific in foreign body localization, cannot identify real loose in foreign body, fails to show the existence and extent of penetrating or blunt trauma. So next one is ultrasound, where it is non-invasive, inexpensive and non-ionizing, easily performed imaging technique. Useful for evaluating eyeball measures, layers, and contents. It's 98% sensitivity for uh, localization of for, uh, detecting intraocular foreign body. So you can see this is the B scan, this is the A scan, this is the foreign body there, and this is the large spike. Next one is A and B scan. This is B scan, this is A scan of the vitreous hemorrhage here. And this is dislocated lens uh, from B scan, ultrasound B scan. B scan showing this is the RD, this is the optic disc uh, which is attached there, and this is the large 
of hemorrhagic choroidal detachment uh, by uh, the scan. So what is the advantages? Uh, advantages are useful in opaque media, detects and localizes radiolucin foreign bodies, and lens position and zonal integrity can be noticed and intraoperatively uh, for the primary repair also it is useful. However, disadvantage, difficult to localize deep-seated foreign bodies, it's difficult to perform in open globe injuries, extraocular muscles is not clearly defined and limited visualization of optic nerve and retrovolvular structures or detections of scleral ruptures. Now, another one is ultrasound B microscopy. It is an imaging te technique that uses high frequency. How, while in the normal A and B scan is 10, um, 10 this, is, this is 50 um, megahertz as sound waves to produce high resolution cross-sectional images of anti segment to the depth of five millimeter. In cases of trauma, it can uh, visualize the angle structures, urinal dialysis, high femur, scleral laceration, and lenticular foreign bodies. Next one is, the computerized tomography scan. It is considered the best imaging modality in or or ocular orbital trauma because it assesses intracranial, facial, and ocular structures. It is available imaging option in most of the emergency services in main hospital. On enhanced orbital CT is the first choice to evaluate orbital trauma. Vascular injuries are suspected, then we need enhanced CT and uh, when also in blunt or penetrating trauma. As you can see, this is the CT scan suggestive of uh, you know, open globe injury. Um, this is a loss of uh, our wall contour, a fat tire sign, scleral discontinuity and intraocular air or intraocular foreign body can be seen. Is the first choice when metallic fragments are suspected. Yeah, you can see there. It is sensitive, it is less for glass and glass and wooden materials where we need MRI. It can appear as hypoattenuated structures that can be confused by air bubbles sometimes. Advantages, it detects soft tissue injuries and orbital wall factors precisely. Uh, easy recognition of intraorbital and or intraocular air. Clearly defines most radiolucin foreign bodies, exact localization of foreign bodies, simultaneous examination of brain and CNS can be done. An enhanced one can be used for suspected vascular trauma and also detects optical canal, optic canal fractures. However, it can, you know, like multiple cluster foreign bodies may be missed, uh, fails to delineate wooden foreign bodies, and thick scan can sometimes miss foreign metallic foreign body. Next one is the MRI, is indicated to visualize. Uh, which is in, indicated when uh, intraocular foreign bodies are uh, suspected. Next one, so this is the MRI scan showing um, uh, foreign body. And next uh, advantage is this, uh, definitely it is mainly for the soft tissue injuries. And OCT is powerful imaging mainly for the evaluating macular trauma. Detailed images of anatomical structure of the eye is, uh, you know, it provides monitoring, especially for the macular and correlating pathology changes, particularly in acute traumatic maculopathy. So this is the, uh, you know, this is following blood. Please trauma. conclude. Yeah. So ocular trauma is one of the most common reasons for ophthalmic consultation. Ultrasound is non-invasive. CT can detect many uh, uh, orbital com and, uh, you know, it can be used for bedside ophthalmic examination. When it is when bedside examination is limited and MRI is important modality in specific circumstances. Sorry to interrupt you, doctor. But That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Ellie. I will now call up our next speaker, Dr. Chandana Chakraborty. Do we have Dr. Chandana? Yes. Yes, doctor. Please start the screen sharing. Good morning. Very good morning to all of you. Chandana, you can move your mask if you are at home. Not at, uh, not at home, sir. Uh, we, have, we have to do. We have to do duty, sir. Okay, you are duty. So you can speak yes. no problem. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so warm greetings from Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Kolkata. Let us see what is the current scenario of ocular emergency here and in COVID-19 and unprecedented Please share your screen. Dr. Chanda, please share your screen. Share screen. Yes, okay. Go ahead.
Is it okay? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. COVID-19 is an unprecedented global pandemic even. During the early phases of pandemics, control measures like national lockdown was implemented, which severely affected the healthcare system, including the ocular eye emergency services. The scenario is more or less, uh, when I go through the literature, I saw that uh, more or less similar in uh, all places, all over the world, uh, and that is applicable naturally to our institute also. This is a tertiary care center, which I saw that in 2020, 2020, there is a market decrease. Three months of the lockdown, actually, we uh, did a study during the three months from March to May. We found that there was only 199 patients during that time, this three months period in the emergency. Whereas if you look at this picture, 2018 and nine, the that is a gross difference of the uh, patient number of patients in the OER. And uh, uh, this has slight bit increase in uh, 2021. Now the patient has started coming, even in emergency also, it has increased. What we saw is that uh, uh, the patient uh, profile wise, 18 years to 65 years, they are the maximum majority of the patient. Whereas more than 65 years, uh, the, there is a decrease in the lockdown period because maybe they could not attend the hospital uh, because of their aging process and the uh, transport problem. Male, naturally, male was a uh, predominant figure who came here. And what you saw is that in the uh, more, a quite a large number of patients, they had home accident. Whereas in a, if you look at the figures in the other, uh, like in 2018 and 2019, the home accident, workplace, playground, and they are almost uh, similar. But coming here in 2020 and 2021, the home accident was quite a lot in number. And accident and injury home uh, was more and what you saw is that usually what happens is that the open globe and closed globe injury, we get more of open globe injury. Uh, but now in COVID era, the closed globe, uh, open globe injury, we uh, got maximum and uh, not the closed globe. Uh, maximum not uh, because these are the patient who were being refused from various uh, centers and uh, they had, uh, we had to do surgery. So maybe this time, this number of patient of uh, this open globe injury increased who came to our emergency. Uh, referral uh, wise, if I look at the picture referral wise, uh, quite a number of patient who came after uh, two hospital reference means they have attended two hospital. After that, they attended to our hospital. So the uh, severity of the injury denotes that the severity of the injury is such that the peripheral center had to refer us. Now, if you look at the scenario, why this patient number of patient decrease, all of you know that the transport problem, the close down nearby, <laughs> refers, yes? Uh, nearby centers of ocular centers, actually many of the centers, the subsidiary center, the primary health center, the, um, even the, some of the medical college also, they didn't <laughs> run properly during this time. So naturally as a tertiary care center, our burden actually increased during this time. Even the number of cataract related complicated patient uh, were a, quite a large number of the patient. We uh, got patients from various distant places also, like from Bangladesh, from Bihar, from uh, Jharkhand, uh, Odisha, from quite a means, uh, even the 500 kilometers was the maximum the patient came here. So uh, lack of information, where the patient will go, the patient didn't know where to go during that lockdown period. Uh, so that was one problem. That's why the patient, there was delayed presentation, we found. Lack of information and lack of transport services, all these things uh, actually caused uh, uh, our anxiety. Anxiety means when the patient came to us, almost many patients came after four to five days of injury, 
and naturally the uh, uh, ac acuity of the vision, the visual prognosis became bad. That uh, this is already we have uh, uh, reported in uh, one of the journal. If we look at the scenario in other countries, the similar situation in Israel, from UK, uh, Italy, all of them they have shown there is an uh, almost fifty percent uh, reduction in the uh, emergency cases. And uh, older patient, elderly age group patient, uh, they were minimum in number when compared. There are some studies from India which have been reported that Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh, and New Delhi, they have also the similar incidents that in New Delhi and AIMS, they have found there is a decrease of 35%. Sorry percent to interrupt you, like doctor. And males increase. conclude the session. Uh, so to conclude, during the COVID-19 first wave, what you saw, there was a drastic decrease in ocular emergency cases, an increased number of referral, an increased home injuries compared to the road traffic and playground, and decrease in elderly and female cases. In the 2021, the second wave, the still the number of referral was higher. Ocular emergency improved uh, than the 2020 period. And uh, we have to now uh, prepare ourselves for the third wave. Uh, we should have enough facilities to the peripheral center. So the, our government should take care of all these things. So we have to urge them that the third wave, we should not uh, want to lose so many eyes and so many uh, vision problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chandana. We now move to our next speaker, Dr. Sabita Devi. Dr. Sabita, please switch on the camera. Dr. Chandana, please stop the screen sharing. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sabita, you can start the screen sharing. Yes, doctor. Yes, I'm audible. Yes, doctor, you're audible. Yes. Very, very good morning to all of you, respected friends. Today we'll start the effect of SMC waste RP screening on the management of RP at MK Medical College. This study is uh, supported by PSFI, NHM, RBSK, and LVPI. <clears throat> so RP is a disorder in developing preterm retina. It is an emerging cause of potentially preventable childhood blindness worldwide. India and other low socioeconomic groups are now facing the third epidemics of RP. So what is the aim of the study? To find the effect of SNCU-based ROP screening on management of ROP. So a retrospective analysis uh, study to, uh, of the past records or the steps taken in the field of ROP in the last past year, five years in MKCG Medical College. So uh, <clears throat> now India is facing the third phase of epidemic in ROP. Because of the highest number of preterm births are around 3.5 million are elderly in the India. Out of 27 million live births, approximately 9% of live births are below 2,000 grams. So there are two main risk factors. One is the high rate of preterm babies and low birth. These are the two main indicators of development of ROP. What are the risk factors of blindness in ROP in India? First, the high birth rate, unequal and variable quality of neonatal care, lack of awareness of the uh, about the ROP in the pediatricians and the parents, non-availability of the trained ROP specialist, lack of information among the parents regarding the prematurity and its complications. So this is the triad of epidemiological triad. That shows what is the main factor is the host factor that is the prematurity and the low birth weight. And the other environmental factor that is the pure, poor neonatal care, immediate unmonitored oxygen supply and the, uh, the dangerous agent is nascent oxygen. <clears throat> So which babies we screen our study? All the, we follow the ICRP classification. All the babies less than 750 grams and less than 34 weeks of gestation are screened. And all preterm babies whose gestational is not well known to us are screened. And any baby which is a high index of species with the pediatrician for the ROP are screened. Even larger babies the, with some uh, associated risk factors like multiple gestation, prolonged mechanical ventilation, or RDS. These babies are screened. In these babies, also find some amount of some babies showing ROP changes. 
So after screening of the five years, and the record shows that in the year 2016, when we started the program, only we are able to screen 100 babies. Though there is an admission of the 620 babies, 28 babies in the HNCU. This process is increased in the year it is to 886, and in the year it is 316, and there is a continuous increase in the year 2020. It is 417. By the, a continuous RFP screening in the pro, uh, screening program in the SNCU and the sensitization program is side by side, so there is an increase in the referral rate to our OPD. So in the year for only isolated RFP screening, only 20 patients are coming uh, in the year 2016. Now in the year 2020, it is increased to 326 referrals from the nearby SNCUs and RFP other pediatricians in our city and in Ganjam district. So, what are the other steps we have given in the year 2016? Intravenous injection uh, was given four injections, and laser was done for one baby with the help of help of LBPI faculties. In the year 2017, we have done intravenous injection 15, and laser was done for four cases. In the year 2018, we give intravenous injection 46, and laser was done in 12 cases. In the year 2019, there are 76 intravenous injections and 20 lasers. In the year 2020, 82 intravenous injection and 14 lasers. So, what are the steps taken in the year 2017? There is an infrastructure development, like the in supply of indirect ophthalmoscope in the SNCU itself, training of the ophthalmologist for the ROP management, involvement of the PG students to the screening program, and establishment of a ROP cell in ophthalmology department. In the modified steps that we take in the year 2018, there is an establishment of a ROP cell in SNCU in a fixed days, a time and scheduled time in the ROP for ROP screening. Training the sister to find out the high risk babies and the C and the CMEs all over the cities and the pediatrician nearby in uh, the cities in the Ganjam district. We multiple we conducted multiple CMEs uh, about the ROP. So what are the added steps we taken in the year 2019? We started giving intrahepatic injections in the uh, SNCU and also uh, in the operation theaters of the MKC medical colleges. So and and we started a ROP awareness program. Among the parents by uh, giving some pamphlets and some radio uh, radio audio visual aids. There is a sensitization of the pediatricians. Study is that ROP activities are restricted to the MKCG Medical College and nearby SNCUs. Around 20% babies are still missing in the screening program. So I uh, think that the teleophthalmologic based ROP screening using the fundus camera may be a new trend to fulfill that drawbacks. But the conclusion of the study, the visual. Sorry to interrupt you, Doctor. Would you yes. would like to please conclude the session? Yes. Visual Thank losses ROP will continue to increase unless there will be a strong collaboration effect among the neonatologists, nurses, ophthalmologists, parents, and the social workers in the government establishment. There is a high quality of neonatal care. Mandatory ROP screening babies are at risk, and availability of the trained ophthalmologists to screen these babies or treat these babies with ROP. So, a cooperative work between the neonatologists. And the pediatricians and uh, the ophthalmologist will help to detection early detection of the ROP cases and timely intervention to this ROP cases are necessary. Not a, uh, only the intervention, but also the proper rehabilitation of ROP afterward. So proper rehabilitation the, of these patients are required. And so by doing all this procedure, there will be a decrease in the ROP blindness in our country. So this program is started by mainly by with the help of LBPI people. Uh, they have a uh, target. They have started the program. They started a program taking a five district in their hand, and uh, one Ganjam district is one of them, and our medical college is one of them, with the help of PHFI and NHM. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Sabita. Thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, all the speakers, for the wonderful session. To start with the next session, I introduce Dr. Sudhir Kumar, Dr. Prakash Marathe, Dr. Deepak 
Mishra, Dr. Najendra Prasad, Dr. Saroj Kumar, Dr. Sudhir Kumar, Dr. Santosh Singh Patel. Hello. Dr. Shukla Rahul, Dr. Sangamitra Kungo. And to start with the session, I call upon the first speaker, Dr. Arjun Kumar. Do we have Dr. Arjun? Dr. Arjun? Before Dr. Arjun comes, uh, let me say a few words. On yes, behalf of coin, I welcome all the speakers and participants of this session of a coin for this particular wonderful program. I welcome Andri Secretary, a coin, National Andri Secretary, Dr. Sopan Samanta, for taking tremendous pains to take this moment of a coin ahead, along with other stalwarts of a coin. Over to you. Sabrina. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. I am Dr. Subuddhi. Ah, I'm nice to meet you, sir. Good yeah. morning, all of you. Yeah, yeah. So please, please continue. Start the program and continue the program. I am listening to you. Continue. Yes, yes, yes. Please sure. continue. We moderate the program also. Okay. I am Dr. Okay. B.R. Subuddhi. Okay. Welcome to this session, everybody. Please just start the program. Is, is, if, uh, yes, please continue. Arjun is here. Uh, we do not have Dr. Arjun. We'll start with the next speaker. Dr. Yeah. Sharad Babu Chillukuri. Dr. Sharad, yeah. please switch on yeah. the camera. Unmute yourself. And please start the screen sharing. Doctor, please unmute the mic. Please unmute the mic, Dr. Sharad. Yeah, can you see this? Yeah, we can. Oh, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, including me in this session, the diabetic retinopathy at the doorstep. So this is the uh, program we have been doing uh, uh, for the past four years. And then we have been, uh, we started doing differently from this year. And uh, this is a hospital-based community eye health project which we have been doing for the past four years. But as, uh, first we thought of having this program only for the screening of the community and also for the school screening program. That's how we started this program. And uh, why we started is because there is limited awareness in the uh, villages and there is a poor access for them. And they have the traditional beliefs and businesses and it is not affordable, the treatment is affordable for them. So we have uh, modeled a different uh, integrated cost effective models. And then we started sensitizing the local communities about the awareness of this program. And then we realized there are, there are a lot of uh, diabetic patients coming in. So we included the diabetic retinopathy screening program also in this program. So uh, the main aim of this program is like uh, getting the uh, eye care services available, accessible and affordable to all so that all can see and uh, delivering the quality eye health uh, in the rural of uh, Telangana districts. And uh, how so we started with the prioritization of villages and making them into clusters and community mobilization and participation of the community, selecting the, some of the community girls, uh, identifying them, training them, and then uh, uh, sending them to the uh, community house to house, having a, uh, the whole data of the community and this is how we started initially with 30 villages and uh, the program uh, continued uh, screening house to house and bringing them to the main uh, uh, center where we used to do uh, screening program by the optometrist. And uh, after that, we realized that uh, there are a lot of diabetic patients and in this program, we realized there are about nine to 10 percent of the patients are diabetics. So we started uh, getting a uh, screening done for the diabetes. Uh, and then whoever have got the diabetes, then those patients are specially uh, uh, made them grouped into different groups. And we have taken the help of the Operation I say to Universal. And uh, they are just, uh, uh, we don't have any financial assistance, but the program is like the estimated budget is for 48 lakhs. 
they were uh, only giving us technical assistance and training for the girls this is how we made into clusters and then another group we have made into uh, the another uh, 14 villages separately because this is a uh, the mulkunur bank which uh, there are a lot of uh, 14 villages uh, farmers are involved in this bank they approached us and so we started doing a different group of 14 villages uh, the same program in those villages and finally this is how we we could uh, uh, put the uh, different clusters onto the map and we started uh, identification of giving them uh, different program and then finally we uh, declared 16 villages blind free out of this 44 villages and six more of them so after this uh, program that we realized uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, diabetic patients here especially in and so we adapted another program that is the diabetic retinopathy screening program of the whole of the city that is include involving 10 lakh population so uh, the blind uh, villages we have screened almost 8, 8600 of them there and then uh, we started uh, treating them with the uh, different lasers and uh, uh, asking them to come back again and uh, this uh, diabetic retinopathy community based program again uh we we thought of uh, doing it and then we started this program with the again uh training of the uh, young uh, people and we had a team of 22 uh people in this program and we started doing it in three different levels one is the screening identifying of the diabetic patients and making them into different forums and uh, identification of the gps of the local areas and then having a referral system and they at the secondary level all the uh, diagnosed diabetic patients are screened for the fundus examination and whoever is necessary those photographs are been sent to the main hospital for the di- uh, retinal surgeon opinion and whoever is necessary they are, uh, are shifted to the main hospital base hospital here so seeing this uh, this is how the project is like identifying the project area procuring the materials and the staff and then training them and then sending them to the field Uh, for the uh, program and this is how we do that vision assessment and then the blood uh, sugar uh, values uh, estimation for every patient who is coming to the uh, program to the screening area and then the photographs are being taken and then sent to the diabetic uh, to the retinal surgeon for diabetic uh, uh, who are all identified they have been shifted to the uh, treatment and this is how we started this program but because of covid that got delayed and probably after a month we will be starting at uh, this program again at a very big level and uh, this is how we used the fundus uh, photographs and then uh, through internet we sent to the base hospital and the uh, uh, required people are being treated at this uh, uh, base hospital and now we are expanding it into the different parts of telangana uh, almost 29 districts are being involved here Uh, with three, uh, four uh, centers, and three are already been there. Tertiary centers, and one more we are establishing, and seventy vision centers we are establishing, so that each and every village of the diabetic patient is being covered and then treated. Sorry and, uh, to interrupt you, doctor. Thank you very much. We would like to conclude the session. Yeah, that's I it. I think Dr. Sharad Babu, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Subodhi knows, and there is a committee of prevention of diabetic retinopathy blindness. i think which is being constituted by ima headquarters as well as all india ophthalmological society and it is our mission mission of ophthalmologists physician diabetologists across the country and you have been doing wonderful job in your state and your region the same has to be followed by all of us across the country thank you so much no, wonderful yeah, the, you, one comment by one comment let us sarath babu i really yes, i am really very happy that you are utilizing teleophthalmology in the vision centers Uh, we are we are we are looking for this teleopathy your teleopathy model for our teleopathy society of india probably you can join with the tosi and the dr screening and jointly we can work together you are also member of our tosi yes sir so we are looking for your i mean looking for towards your this presentation in our tosi meetings definitely sir i am there okay thank you thank you very much nice thank you dr sharath for your session i now call upon the next speaker Dr. Somad Prasad, do we have Dr. Somad? Dr. Somad will not be there. Okay. Easy. So I, Easy. I call upon the next speaker, Dr. Sunil Singh. Do we have Dr. Sunil? Yeah, he is here. 
Okay. Dr. Yes, Sunil, yes. please switch on your camera and start the yes. screen sharing. Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Uh -huh. Actually, uh, I can't share my screen. There's some technical fault. I will do audio only. I will do the same. Uh, okay, doctor. Just give, give, give me a few seconds. In the meantime, welcome to Professor Dr. Santan Gopal, sir, past president of the Ophthalmological Society. We are very happy to have you in our acquaintance session this morning. So I uh, I can't share my screen. Can I go on audio only? Please continue, sir. Continue, please. Yes, sir. Sir, sir. So my, my, my topic is uh, is diabetic macular edema and update. I'm Dr. Sunil from Patna. I am a national coordinator of Coin. I'm an active member of Coin, and I have been made a state coordinator of IMA AI was project by Dr. BNR Sumiti, and I think that will go a long way in uh, controlling diabetic blindness in the uh, nationwide and Bihar also. So our introduction. Diabetes is one of the leading cause of blindness today with clinically significant macular edema contributing greatly to this vision loss. The WHO estimates that more than 150 million people worldwide have diabetes and prevalence is around 40% in diabetes. Diabetic retinopathy is more common in type 1 diabetes than in type 2. Now the question was snow in India. About 50 million people suffer from diabetes. In Bihar only, at least 50 lakh people are suffering having diabetes. And approximately 25 lakh people, that is nearly 50%, are having any form of retinopathy. And about 5 lakh people are having sight threatening retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy is an important cause of vision loss in working age group. Despite glycemic, despite glycemic BP and BP control and lasers, large number of people suffer from irreversible loss of vision. Recently, vision loss related to diabetes is decreasing in India and also the Western world due to change in management of diabetes. Now, the prevalence is prevalence is any retino any retinopathy uh, in any retinopathy is percentage in IDDM is seventy one percent. And percentage in IDDM is 47%. And about proliferative diabetic retinopathy is 23% in IDDM and 6% in NIDDM. As for macular edema, it's 11% in IDDM and 8% in NIDDM. And again, in India, I said the scenario and all of this thing, and uh, the factors affecting diabetic retinopathy is type 1 diabetes has higher incidence of diabetic retinopathy and sight threatening diabetic retinopathy. This is uh, almost prevalent, similar in all the races. Six is men is having higher frequency of developing proliferative diarrhea. Age is it is infrequent before puberty. Duration is most consistent relationship. Glycemia is most modifiable factor. Recent decreasing trend of diabetic retinopathy is attributed to strict diabetes, diabetes ADM control with HPL when I see less than seven. Blood pressure is a significant predictor. Now the classification, I will say, classification below you know, it's mild, it's non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it's mild NPDR, moderate NPDR, severe NPDR, and very severe NPDR. And now it is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It is composed of NVD or NVE, and it is uh, pre-retinal or vitreous hemorrhage, fibrous tissue proliferations. Now the only PDR is with new vessels, high-risk PDR, the classification, and the, the, the most clinically significant macular edema. It is thickening of the retina at or within 500 micron from the center of the macula, or it is hard exudates with thickening of the adjacent retina located at or within 500 micron from the center of the macula or a zone of retinal thickening, one disc area or larger in size located at or within one disc diameter from the center of the macula. So clinical significant macula is, edema is more important and you see that uh, the pictorial things, I, sorry, I can't share, it is the hemorrhage and the microaneurysm. You can see the venous feeding, the venous is the, the hemorrhage and microaneurysm, the, 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 the venous bleeding is here. 
Irma, Irma, you can see Irma is here. This is NBE. This is NBD. Now this is more important, clinically significant macular edema, you can see. You can see the fundus photograph here. And this is the positive finding. So the treatment is laser. It's focal, grid, or modified grid. Now the injections, either steroid or anti -vigil. Steroid is IVTH or Ozodex, and anti vgf is Macrogen, Eccentrics, Avastin, or Ilea, or it's a combination therapy. Now, grid laser for CSME, you can see it's the grid laser. Grid laser is here. Macular ischemia, PDR, grid laser. And we, so green laser, is, laser PRP is in two or three sittings, preferably a gap of one week from RK to ORA, at least two disc diameter all around. If the phobia, at least two, two, two disc diameter all around, phobia is left unlasered. So this is all I can, sorry, I cannot do the slide sharing for some technical fault. And, but uh, as a coordinator of IMA, I was PDB project, let me assure you that in Bihar, with physicians from cooperation and community of Pramoji, Dada, Bena Subhuti, sir, we will go a long way in alleviating the site threatening, potential site threatening complication of diabetic blindness. We'll, go, we'll work in tandem with AIOS and AIMA because I am vice president of IMA Bihar also. And I am I, I'm national coordinator of AIOS and I have been an estate coordinator. So the, the, the prevention of diabetic blindness is very important thing. And we will, as a as, as, as state coordinator and as with the guidance of uh, Sopan Samantha Dada and the guidance of Bihar Subhuti sir, at least for Bihar, I can tell you, it will go a long way in uh, controlling blindness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunil, for your session. Uh, a few words about me. The very good presentation by Dr. Sunil. It is very difficult to cover the whole topic in a small session, but he has shown the uh, very good uh, presentation at all. Thanks uh, for the excellent session. And uh, I think uh, if, uh, next presentation, Dr. Sorry, yes. Yes. Now I call upon what, Dr. What Santosh. Time, there is a lot of time. A lot of time. Why I want to say one one minute? Yes. Hello, Dr. Singh. Dr. Sunil Singh. Really, it's a wonderful uh, presentation, and we are looking forward for your cooperation in our in the IMA PDP program. You know, so we we are uh, our main aim is to create awareness in the rural areas. That is the most important thing, and also to screen all the people. You know, that's very important. So we, we take you as the state coordinator for our program, and we want your full cooperation for this program to be even almost all the rural parts of the Bihar. So Dr. Sunil Singh, you Sir, sir, Can sir. Can you hear me, Dr. Singh? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes. Am I audible? So, so yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? I'm once the, once the COVID is over, once the COVID, yes, tell me. Yes, after yeah. this, sir, Apura Aitam Diabetic Blindness Bihar, mein, sir, we will do a long way. Just guide us and we will continue with the program and we will we'll definitely meet with success okay. of Bihar, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Next speaker. Yes. To start the session, I call the next speaker, Dr. Santosh Mahapatra. Dr. Santosh, please unmute yourself. Yes, Dr. Santosh, you can start the session. Am I audible? Yes, Dr. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Akhavan, for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, laser in diabetic retinopathy is a very huge topic. I would like to touch the key points and already about diabetic macular retinopathy, my previous speaker very elaborately uh, described the things. Now, where do we stand? Lasers is like Amitabh Bachchan. And the rest of the things come, and but still he is standing with all the uh, way to go. 
commonly used lasers are frequency arc doubled or argon laser and diode laser there are different modes of delivery slit lamp and indirect uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy delivery are time tested ones now we have come with pascal laser which gives up di different patterns of delivery for both diabetic macular edema as well as pedia it has advantage of providing uh, the laser in a uh, more rapid way and in a very very specific way lasers in dme uh, the first line it is a first line therapy for non central involving dme and patients who are have contraindications for anti vgfs and also can be given as adjuvant for failure cases who have taken anti vgfs macular photocoagulation can be either focal grid or modified grid the focal laser is directly applied over the point of leak grid and modified grid over the diffuse leak areas the etdrs has significantly contributed for significance of laser in dme so the uh, focal leaks uh, uh, between 500 to 3000 micron are treated with focal treatment and a uh, 0.1 second duration between 550 to 100 micron spot size is applied this is how the grid laser is applied in the temporal area and modified grid where both combination of and grid are given so diabetic retinopathy study validates the usefulness of lasers in dme there are few side effects of focal laser and that's why a modified version of sub threshold diode microprose laser has come which is uh, causing less uh, burns and less destruction of the central vision and selective retina therapy that is srt for clinical significant macular edema also has the advantages of very specifically treating the areas now lasers for dme indications include like pdr with high risk characters or pdr uh, but in cases of pdr without ischemia or very severe npdr also we can consider prp uh indication of prp also includes situation where we cannot give anti vgf like pregnancy nephropathy cardiac failure and uh, uh situations where uh, we cannot go for anti vgfs prp we can again deliver in slit lamp mode or indirect mode and this is given in sessions this is the first session second session and third session almost covers the whole of the retina but you need to avoid preretinal hemorrhages fractional elevations or previous periretinal scars and major retinal vessels these are the parameters how we we deliver uh, treatment for diabetic macular edema and pdi this is how a good laser retina looks after the pan retinal photocoagulation additional prp may be considered for non regressing new vessels persistent new vessels recurrent vitreous hemorrhage or extensive retinal lesions and the skip lesions there are few complications of prp can be met and that's why modified lasers like navigate laser has come into play and it is well documented one we can go for navilas when the we have contraindications or complications for prp you can directly see the areas and put lasers over the desired areas in navelas injections already described by my previous speaker includes anti vgfs and steroid depending upon the situation you can give steroid for particularly for dme but anti vgfs can be used both for dme and pdi only but we are reserving these cases only when we cannot give lasers So to support this hypothesis, there are different studies which have come, like Protocol S, Protocol T, uh, for this uh, lasers in diabetic retinopathy. The current indications for PPV are only truncated. All these situations, the laser is still holding good, like the Amitabh Bachchan. So the take home message is 
Major is still considered the gold standard in management of diabetic retinopathy and backbone of management options in diabetic retinopathy in a country like India. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Santosh, can I ask one question? Yes. Can the, can, can the lasers be provided in the rural areas where the doctors can do the laser in the rural areas? In the, in yes, the rural areas, in primary health centers. Yeah. Please. Primary health centers, we need to train people how to do laser. Otherwise, it is a uh, safe procedure. Yes. Also, the teleophthalmology can also help in educating them. Yes, yes, our plan is like that. So, in a teleophthalmology plan, when laser can be taken and can be done in the any rural areas or the primary health centers, the laser can be done? Yes. The pri primary, because it's a hand on training, uh, initial, initial training should be done in a higher center. Later on, they can be assisted via teleophthalmology to do the lasers in primary centers also. Okay. Thank you. I have one question, Doctor, I just uh, want to ask. Uh, for diabetic macular, diffuse diabetic macular edema, you go for the laser directly or go inject antiphase of first and then, then go for it the laser? It depends upon the area, sir. If okay. it is a non-center involved in macular edema, we definitely can consider laser as the first. But the edge protocol is, is definitely having some other indication for uh, doing lasers. But if in case of center involving macular edema, yeah. TBGF can be considered. I have one question to Professor PNR Subuddhi. Yes. Yes. Professor Subuddhi, you are our national captain from AIOS, IMA, as well as ACOIN to lead this diabetic retinopathy prevention program. So may I suggest one thing, or I'd like to know from you, that in the late, uh, the late 80th of the past century, uh, we have ventured uh, identification and motivation of cataract clients of the community. So we used to send village volunteers door to door to find out the cataract cases. So have you got any such program, or can you plan any such program to find out the diabetic retinopathy cases from the community, from door to door? Because with all the webinars and meetings, it will not go good. Those yes. patients are still lying in the villages, not at all aware of all the avenues of their management. So how can we make the plan to identify and motivate them for treatment, diabetics at the doorstep? So that, that is the question I put to Dr. Santos Mahapatra, whether laser can be utilized in the rural areas to yes. uh, now, laser the people. Because our aim, we must go with the door to door with the technicians, optometrists, optometrists with AI guided mobile cameras. AI guided mobile camera, they will go from door to door, they take the pictures and they send the pictures to the base center, either the primary health center or somewhere in the secondary health center, they will send the pictures. And from the pictures, we can know who needs treatment, who doesn't need any treatment, only follow up. So simultaneously, they first of all, the we have to find out. First, we will have to find out that patients with diabetic retinopathy from the community. Sir, that is the first task. Sir, for that, I need to just put uh, my first photograph is not uh, uh, enough for the treatment protocols and I think so. No, 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 no. AI guided. It's AI guided. Yeah. The, you know, artificial yeah, yeah. intelligence. AI guided, guided, definitely. Yes. They will Sir, can I, the Sir, can I add something? Sir, can I add something? Yes. Sir, yes. Actually, I found that as we go down to the, to the yes, deep please. rural area, uh, poverty becomes the yes, major sir. problem in tackling diabetic retinopathy. As we know that uh, lasers and antibiotics right. are important uh, uh, tools for uh, uh, treatment of the diabetic retinopathy, and this becomes unaffordable. Can with this platform we can you do uh, make them affordable by any other means like donation or uh, something like that or government uh, help? Now, can I ask something? That is the only thing. I came out. We are working on that. Yes, please. Yes, please, Dr. Prakash. Ah, so Dr. Samantha, sir, about your question, yes. I think most of us are pretty yes. clear 
that whenever the patient is educated and in a position to afford the expenses, is okay. taking treatment of diabetes and going to ophthalmologist also. Now our aim at yes. IMA as well as AIOS and community ophthalmology is the screening purpose. Like where to screen the people, those who are diabetics, yes. that is number one. If the people yes. are diabetic, yes. no, no. there are paramedicals, they can take the fundus photograph and send that particular thing by teleophthalmology to higher centers so that that particular photograph can be interpreted properly by super specialist, that is VR specialist. Once the diabetic retinopathy is not that critical, we will just take the follow-up. But if it is the critical diabetic retinopathy where the treatment is needed, I think that person can be taken to secondary and tertiary center where the treatment can be properly given. Yes. Basic thing is screening of diabetics at yes. all levels and what you're talking about in rural areas also. That should be our aim. So teleophthalmology and then screening at many more places, including rural area, should be our aim and treating the complicated diabetics where the diabetic retinopathy is grade three, grade four, and even preventive point of view, we should take these patients to higher centers. Thank you, sir. Dr. Dr. Prakash, uh, along with the screening, along with the hello, sorry, Dr. Dr. Sir, Dr. Prakash, Dr. Is along with screening, awareness is very important. Awareness is very important. So we. Sorry, time is over. Hello. Yes, okay. doctor. Time is over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There is one more talk. We can uh, move forward. There is no other talk. There is no other. Talk. Oh, sir, no other talk. No talk. Still, there are three, four minutes. Let us sum up yes. and let us discuss. Yeah, about... yeah, but what yes, sir. You can take two minutes. Yes. Uh, 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 I, I, I have one can I can I add something? Can I add something? Yes. Yes, sir. Whatever sure. said, the equine has to work in the rural areas only. Yes. Reach the unreached people. That our aim. Equine is the, that is the sole aim. We have to reach the unreached yes. people. So we go to the rural areas, so, create awareness and do the screening. Then most important, you what, create what awareness and do the screening. What can I, I ask you think? Professor Subhuti, Dr. Sunil Singh, Dr. Marathi, and Dr. Shantan Gopal is there. I would like to suggest a very simple model. What we have prepared long back, 30 years back, in the Ranibad tribal block of Bankura district of West Bengal, that, that for motivation and identification of cataract client in those days, now we like to find out the diabetic retinopathy. So can we prepare a village volunteer team of four or five only with school living certificate to award them only with the very simple symptoms of diabetes. Yes. They will just visit every door to door of the village and try to find out the diabetic suspects first of all and take them to the ASA worker or multi-purpose worker for their urine examination and other in the nearby health center. Thereby first they will find out the diabetics and then the ophthalmic assistant of the health center they will find out whether they have got diabetic retinopathy or not. Then and then we can proceed with all these newer treatment of diabetic retinopathy, laser or anything. But what should be right, seen... absolutely right. That's why that I am a PDP. Yes. Along with the IOS task force. Yes. We are working on that. Actually, this pan-India mucormycosis in eye has shown us only one thing, that so many undiagnosed Diabetics are there in the community. Mm -hmm. They are in the Raigar, in the Stuttgart. Whatever cases of mucomycosis have found out, about 329 cases, all had blood sugar more than 400. And most of them are undiagnosed. That's why this is a new arena of thinking. And I would request each one of you to give a thought in which best possible way with the village volunteers. The simple guys, they can detect the diabetic suspect from the community. And first of all, we have to find out how many diabetics are there and then diabetic retinopathy will be detected. Can I add one point? That is the point. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something? Yes. Please. Yeah. 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 I, I totally agree with the, uh, the, the, the doctor at the doorsteps model of Sapan Samantha, sir. If for screening, we can go to the doorsteps and the PHC level. And for that, for the interpretation after telemethalmology, we don't need a VR specialist. Even a general ophthalmologist can say ki whether we need treatment or not. If somebody needs treatment, then uh, the, the government is giving lasers in all medical colleges and district hospitals. With this, I would suggest that a coin, a coin can do one thing. Like the government, a coin job is to do advocacy also. 
so like the government is having all boost program for the cataract and giving so much money for the cataract uh, uh, surgery they should give that money for the laser also and that coin should do advocacy for that even the private practitioner if they does does laser for bpl people or whatever people the government should fund for that so i coin to can do advocacy for that छत्तीसगढ़ sir we can uh, do uh, screening at local level with any uh, general ophthalmologist and we can uh, diagnose with tele ophthalmology at uh, base center then we can send a uh, retina specialist for the laser with uh, lio in periphery he can do a laser so in different uh, hospitals we will have to conclude the yeah. session it's yeah. already time up okay Oh, thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, 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 thank you,